1797, the Anglican Church in Trinidad and Tobago, like the other islands under British colonial rule, was part of the Diocese of London. By 1827, Trinidad became part of the newly created Diocese of Barbados. But 51 years later, it became independent of Barbados, consecrating Bishop Rawl, who was to be the first Bishop of Trinidad and Tobago, in the Parish Church of the Holy Trinity and the Cathedral Church of the Diocese of this country. By 1844, an ordinance had already been passed making the Church of England the established church in the West Indies. The colored people, the colored people had to sit behind the whites and the uh, African slaves, of course, sat in the back of the church. The back of the cathedral is interesting because underneath the, um, the altar, which is now sometimes called the All Souls Altar, it is said that the slaves, um, the nannies, sat there on very low benches with the children while the um, grooms, men and buggy drivers, cab drivers went to the square and uh, sang hymns and danced and, and there is a, a kind of story that there is where the spiritual baptist was formed way across there. Um, and uh, because the men, while they waited on worship service here. Even after the abolition of slavery, the colonial traditions continued well into the 20th century. I recall, of course, in those days, the colonial days when I was a boy growing up, all the important national occasions. There was a church service, and um, the one thing about singing in the choir as a little boy was you always had a seat. <laughs> and uh, the governor and his wife would be sitting up in the front pew here, you know. The bishop would be in his throne and the music and the whole atmosphere of a great service. We had a marvelous boys choir in those days. My parents attended the cathedral, the whole family. My father was a member of the vestry and secretary of the vestry. And uh, my brothers all sang in the choir and so forth. I was confirmed right at these steps, right from uh, within a stone throw from where I'm sitting. And, and then when I was elected bishop in 1970, I was consecrated, kneeling again right there. But the movement towards independence had begun, and it spread throughout these islands. At that time, the dean here was an Englishman. One of the things I said at the first synod was, look, there was no need for us to pray, to pray for the Queen of England. What we need to do is pray for the Governor General and subsequently for the President of the country. Well, the Dean, the English Dean, he probably had ap apoplexy almost. He subsequently retired, resigned. But the whole point, you see, was to change the focus to where we are. I remember preaching about the Christmas message, which has to do with the Incarnation. Jesus was born amongst us and that is Christian theology. The Christian faith is to be exercised and witnessed amongst ourselves, not in some faraway place. And uh, so in terms of dress, um, for example, I only wore a cassock when I was performing a particular liturgical quest uh, function and I would wear a purple shirt as I am dressed now and um, I walked about town, not in a cassock as my predecessor, but I, I identified with the people and I spoke often on their behalf. When, for example, that whole question of building the, uh, the new racing complex in Carony, I stood up in Woodford Square along with one or two radicals and I said along with them, it was, you remember, um, houses before horses because they were going to spend a lot of money in an, for an air-conditioned facility for horses when so many of our people were so badly housed. Bishops and clergymen throughout the Caribbean fought alongside their countrymen for an end to colonialism and recognition of the value of our own people and culture. At that time, in 1970, when I came, if you remember, there was the social upheaval and uh, 
uh, Woodford Square was closed, there was a state of emergency. Uh, Dr. Eric Williams, Prime Minister, felt that his government was uh, threatened by this black power movement, as you recall. Well, one of the things that, that I had to do was to listen to the voice or voices of that movement which called for a greater perception of the native blacks in the decision making of the church and of the country. So one of the first things I did was to set up um, scholarships to educate the clergy more than how they were educated themselves so that they could lead the church theologically into the 20th century. And one of the products of that was Dean Nolly Clark himself. And the changes in the country were reflected in the daily life of the cathedral, which achieved the delicate balance of keeping true to the teachings of the Anglican Church while celebrating the unique culture of our own people and making all Anglican churches relevant to them. I got one of the young people to write music that reflected the life of the community. Uh, Mr. Patrick Alley gave us music and we had a Calypso Mass as it was called. So we changed the music of the church. Uh, we had steel bands, steel pans if you like, and steel bands in the church. That was another thing at the first time. Um, and to this day, of course, the Dean has one here, but it wasn't the first time that we had a, a steel orchestra playing regularly in the church. In the last 30 years, the localization and the indigenous process has escalated tremendously because in that period, the bench of bishops is now totally Caribbean. Forty years ago, there was only one Caribbean bishop. Now we are totally Caribbean. But in addition to the indigenization of the leadership, we've also been working very hard to try to change Anglicanism so that it becomes a little more representative of our Caribbean. For example, we are a singing people and a musical people. And you'll find that our worship lasts, the average worship here will last longer than it does in England, about twice as long. Because in England, they hardly ever sing more than three hymns in a service. And our people will feel cheated if they, they weren't given the opportunity to sing and express themselves. Trinity Cathedral is woven into the very fabric of the faith and the country over which it presides. It is serving as a, a sort of spiritual center, one of the spiritual centers of Trinidad and Tobago. For example, the mayor speaks of this cathedral as one of the city shrines and me as a, um, the dean of the city of Port of Spain. The parish church of the Holy Trinity was consecrated in 1823. It is a magnificent manifestation of the resilience and faith of its pioneers, who saw their original church, a wooden structure built in 1801, destroyed by the fire of Port of Spain, and the foundations of another, torn down amidst controversy, mid-construction in Woodford Square. Eventually, Lord Woodford, source the land on which the cathedral now stands. He became a benefactor of this cathedral. He saw to it himself and he got the then colonial secretary to design a building. And this building is designed on what was very famous in England at the time, um, the Gothic style. The Gothic style cathedrals had been restored in England um, and many people were building churches in this style.
Most of the materials came out from England um, and uh, the stained glasses, again, our beautiful stained glasses, we all came out from England. And um, lots of help given possibly by British troops. So it was um, a mixture of the British troops and local craftsmen um, building this cathedral. Um, some people think some of the royal engineers participated in the building of this cathedral. By 1873, Trinity Cathedral, no longer under the Diocese of Barbados, consecrated its first bishop, Bishop Roll. It now had the dual role of being the cathedral church of the Diocese of Trinidad and Tobago and a parish church. This became the mother church of the diocese, it's a cathedral. Here's where the, as if you look across there, you'll see the bishop's um, throne. That's why it's called a cathedral. It's where the bishop, it's the, really the bishop's church. He, his spiritual court headquarters is right here. And he comes to the cathedral at high points, Easter, Christmas, Pentecost. Bishop Roll tirelessly worked for improvements in the cathedral but died before fulfilling his dream of having a chancel built. But his dream was carried on by members of the congregation who worked tirelessly to raise funds for a chancel, which was consecrated on Trinity Sunday, 1887. Seating was kind of hierarchical in that um, the governor sat where the um, central door was and he and his entourage sat there. The pulpit itself was very high. Um, we, we Anglicans sometimes laugh at high pulpits because we say that these pulpits are six feet above contradiction. So your congregation can't um, contradict what you're saying. You're so high and rarefied. But if spilled itself had to be cut down. The cathedral can hold up to a thousand people and its bells would peal and chime out hymns across the city, inviting people to worship. I lived at East Dry River, and that were they called the Lavantil Hills. And my home is actually overlooking the city. And we're at the, due to the chiming of the bells, in that distance, you could have heard the chiming of the bells prior to the service like a 15 minutes or a half an hour before the services because they ch it chimed at intermittent times. So it, many of us had clocks in our homes at the time due to poverty. So that bell was a signal to tell you, well, church near to start, you have to hurry to get down. And then those days you walked down to church because there was no sort of transportation in those days. The crests of the eight dioceses in the West Indies, including Barbados, Windward Islands, Bahamas, Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, Belize and Jamaica, decorate the cathedral. Today, the cathedral is replete with new lighting and a sound system that takes its services ringing throughout the aisles and gives the full effect of its organ, one of the finest and oldest in the Caribbean. The Cathedral of the Holy Trinity is far more than a denominational church. It has freely opened its doors to national activities, including the opening of the law term, meetings of credit and labor unions, and music festivals in which children throughout the country participate. Anglicanism today, although 1400 years old, is rooted in tradition and scripture, in the Old and New Testaments. That our teaching is um, balanced, um, it has scripture, it has tradition, and we apply that scripture, that tradition to reason. And so we see ourselves as Catholic, but yet Reformed. That is to say that the Anglican Church um, in the Great Reformation, and in one sense, as you indicated, the Renaissance, which 
was part of that Reformation development. Um, in the Great Reformation, which began in Germany in 1517 by Martin Luther, um, the German reformer, Calvin in Geneva, Zwingli in Switzerland, and in England, we, um, we had people like Cramner and uh, the, um, who initiated um, the Reformation. So we see ourselves reforming, reformed, but yet Catholic. found that worship was, had been taken away from the people because the priests um, would celebrate away from the people, his back turned to the people and uh, um, in a sanctuary all by himself and in a language that was not then spoken, the language, um, Latin language. And so one of the basic tenets of the Reformation apart from going back to scripture, but is to produce a common worship where people could understand, a people's worship. And out of that came for the Anglicans a book, a prayer book, um, which a book of common prayer, where it was written in English so that the English people could understand it. And wherever Anglicanism goes, is a, um, the book is translated into the language of the people. medieval church had taken away the giving of the wine or the precious blood from the people. Um, the Anglican church and other reformed churches maintain or return to the both distrib the distribution in both kinds, the both elements, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ under the forms of bread and wine. Even that had its un misunderstanding. It is felt that sometimes the Roman Catholic uh, Church, and particularly the medieval aspect of it, used to see the sacrament as a kind of um, uh, 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 second Calvary, that is to be a, repeat, a reputation of Calvary, what we did, I think. And the Anglican Church emphasized it's a once for all action that took place in Calvary, on the at Good Friday, and what we do here is a making present of that one eternal sacrifice. medieval age and perhaps the early age there would be only one person that is a priest here we have um, uh, uh, so many people ministers of God and that's how we understand our church that is not ordination is not only the um, the province or ministry is not only the, uh, the province of the clergy or the ordained persons there are many ministers all the time, the members of the church have a ministry, and it is all of us who have this ministry. It is not only clergy who have this ministry, and this has been brought forth very significantly in one of our recent um, ways of putting over a number of questions and answers in respect of our faith. And one of those questions comes in a revised catechism that is now part and parcel of our worship and our education in which the question is asked who are the ministers of the church and the answer is 
laypersons, bishops, priests and deacons. The, the word bishop means overseer and this is my role in respect of the people of God who are Anglicans within this Diocese of Trinidad and Tobago. And this overseeing is total and it is within all the 30 parishes and the one district of our diocese. Uh, the bishop's role is that of being the father of the community and ensuring that God's will and purpose is done in all places where there are Anglicans. In the Anglican Church, morning prayer is one of the essential services of the morning. And in the evening, we have a similar service called the evening prayer. They're both similar services, but one is where we thank God for the night that has passed, which is the morning prayer. The evening, a form of thanksgiving again, thanking God for the day that has passed and asking for guidance during the night. Those are simply what we call our morning and evening prayer. Also, we have the Holy Eucharist, which is celebrated either morning or evening. They are similar. It could be for either a requiem, the normal mass of the day, or a festival like today, you know. But that is the Holy Eucharist, which is one of the greatest thanksgiving one can give in their life to Christ. Anglicanism as a manifestation of the Reformation, places as much of an emphasis on faith, spirituality and service as it does on tradition and ritual. I have found the Anglican Church and its doctrine the most comprehensive in the sense that it permits people of varying, various emphases, various traditions to, to remain a part of the Anglican Church. It is also true I think that it relies on common sense. It calls for reason. It does not ask you when you come into the church to leave your brains outside. Some people, you know, the, you, know the, the, you, you come in and you think that they're so, you're so stupid you can understand and accept everything they're saying. Not at all. The Anglican Church permits you to bring your brains with you, to bring your gifts as well. So that whether they are gifts of dance, music, art, whatever, bring that as well because they reflect the glory of God. The church has helped me in terms of developing a faith that is so strong that I feel comfortable about everything I do. I was very ill in 1976. I was paralyzed for a year, nine months of my life. And during that time, the church kept me going because everybody prayed for me. Everybody was part of what was happening to me. And I developed within myself the feeling that I depended on the church and the church gave me the strength to go on living. I was able to walk. I can't say the day I actually walked, but I was able to walk and to come into this church and after that to be able to drive again with a prognosis that I'd hardly ever walk again so I had a wheelchair. And the faith that the church gave me assured me that all was well if I believed. Coming to worship is faith despite you might be lacking many material things in life due to finance and whatnot but you have faith and some and have faith and things would happen. The Anglican Church not only has a message, it also has a life. It has the ability to be the conduit of God's grace. It also has been given the authority to help you become the kind of person God intends. I don't have the image of that. God has that image. But I believe that the church can help you identify and be aware of the image that God has for you to become the person you ought to be. We need to hold on to our faith within the church and to believe in our church and to always remember the principles taught to us at confirmation. 
and the principles that we are guided by through the elderly in our church who have always taught us what it means to love God and to love your brother as yourself. In 1830, although only two priests ran a single Anglican church here, they established four schools almost immediately, laying the foundation work of the church in this country and the region. Today, there are 60 primary and four secondary Anglican schools which are aided by the state in this country. If you preach the message of the gospel, you cannot help but deal with the conditions within which people live. The gospel is for everybody, not any, for any particular group. So that uh, when you discover and when you see you, the, the conditions of some people, you have to call attention to them, to that, to that plight. And so, for example, in education, um, we had to insist that, that, that we had to spread the facilities of education more and more and assist the government in so doing. At the same time, not losing the purpose of education, which was not simply to give people a good education on paper, but give them a responsibility for the community within which they were to live. The cathedral takes the lead in making Anglicanism alive and relevant to every member of the congregation and society, with special emphasis on the poor and vulnerable. For the young people, I have presently, as you look across there, a steel orchestra which plays every Sunday. I have a um, music school, I have, uh, and for persons, I also have a school of literacy and numeracy, a small program of literacy. We have a health clinic, a legal aid clinic, um, Dr. Patrick, Alan Patrick is the head of the medical uh, clinic and Mr. Vernon Clark of the registrar of this diocese um, has a, um, a legal program. We help an empowerment program, skill training of uh, young people. There are a lot of homeless people out there who, who are in need of help. Right? They come to the church all the time for whatever assistance we have to offer, right? But most of the time they need financial assistance or a daily meal. You know, they appreciate that more than, you know, the food stuff because some of them, they don't have a, a homes where they could go to prepare the dry stuff that they would be given. So they would need a meal instead of whatever food stuff. We are the church for the people. We meet the people at the point of their needs where they they most need help. And we have people coming in like this morning, only this morning there was a young woman here who had lost her family in a fire, right? And she was at a very low state in her life. She was very depressed and we were able to offer her spiritual upliftment and also encourage her that you know to go on she had lost her children and she as she said she didn't know what she would have done if she had come face to face with that man who had set her house on fire but as a church we were able to reach out to her and give her that strength and encouragement to go on our philosophy basic philosophy is caring you know in, in a godly way and um, I think that uh, this particular need is so basic that uh, it had to happen. Uh, we have very committed nurses and of course preventive medicine is, is the medicine. And so in fact there's a nurses group that goes around counseling people on, on how not to get ill, on being well, on wellness. Um, our, the doctors also assist in this program but our um, main input is caring of the sick. Uh, the Cathedral Church and the Anglican community is, is very keen on taking care of everyone. There's no limitation uh, because of creed or, or race or belief uh, in this clinic. Anyone can come into the clinic so long as you, have, um, you come and register and you pay, I think, one dollar. Uh, how does the church uh, view this? The church views this in, in the context of, of a godly caring for mankind and uh, the kind of people who we aim for, people who cannot afford 
um, specialist care normally or even general care or people who um, are going to the clinics and are not able to be seen in between their appointments and then people who uh, find that they are the bottom of their problems and um, you know they fall off about to fall off the cliff and that kind of person uh, we're able to help immediately because that person might go to the dean or to one of the priests or, or to a friend and indicate um, the, the serious nature of their problem uh, be it uh, psychological, psychiatric or medical or even uh, psychosocial and, uh, and this how come they refer to us here as a wide range of people who refer and uh, we try our best to ensure that uh, some positive input is given and, uh, and that we're helping their general well-being. So it's a kind of a total caring of the person, if you like. Um, in, and the church is very privileged to have uh, that role, and we are very privileged to be asked to be the vehicle uh, to implement that. The needy are really in grave need. I mean, poverty, extreme poverty, is not unusual in this, uh, in this cathedral community. And um, I'm sure this is a sample of what goes on nationally. Um, I think that a lot of people literally can't afford on some occasions to buy an aspirin. Uh, I must also tell you that a lot of well-wishers give us gifts uh, from scales to uh, pads for the couches to of course drugs and to uh, uh, the um, ophthalmoscopes for examination of the eyes and blood pressure machines and so on. People have been just wonderful. This is just one example of Anglicanism. I mean, each um, parish unit has a project such as this. It might not be a medical clinic, some other form of outreach. And uh, we have people who visit the sick. I think that's a very important group. We have people who uh, spread the word of God. We have people who look after the underprivileged. We have the Mother's Union taking care of the children and the mothers and so it goes on. There are hundreds of little groups and not so little, so the important groups I should say. And I, I want to tell you that uh, certainly all I can tell everybody else is to keep on keeping on because uh, you tire sometimes, you feel maybe it's um, somebody else to go on. No, you have to be the person to, to carry the banner. Um, and I think that this is in fact happening. The church, with the cathedral at its helm, has also played a major role in uplifting the most vulnerable amongst us. In addition to running seven training programs, it also gives hope to those without any safety nets. In institutions such as the Princess Elizabeth Centre and San Fernando Technical Institute, the St. Clair Home for the Elderly and Daily Mail Association are other examples. The home started with Dean Holt's wife in the 50s and there were little barracks in those days and they catered to um, unwed mothers and um, different people that had no homes and they, from there they went on to improve the environment. It's run by the management and committee and um, I am part of the committee and uh, we try to keep our residents intact. I am very firm, very strict. In the true spirit of Anglicanism, this home takes care of people not on the basis of their faith, but their need. They are just ordinary people and um, they strive to be happy they are not all Anglicans, they are mixed, but it doesn't matter. They all communicate with each other and also with myself. We try to keep them intact by giving them um, a monthly communion. And they are intact with the church, the dean or the deacon or whoever is always here to give them communion and service. Support for the elderly in the Anglican church is spread far beyond the home. We started the Generation Link and we had the first session at All Saints Hall when we invited the parishes to send members to come in and talk about how the young people can assist the elderly. And Trinity is the best one so far. There's also a firm commitment to the young which emanates from the cathedral. Whatever is happening, we need our young people 
because those of us who are old now will have to go on. And for the church to continue, our young people will have to take responsibility. And so on the board, we go out to them with outreach programs. We go to the schools and we do some of the lecture series for them. And we ask the parishes to write us regularly and say where they have needs so that we can help them fulfill those needs. And the cathedral helps build on the foundation of every society, family life, which is vital in these times of domestic violence and broken homes. One is family life in terms of developing a system where families can stay together. And not only would children be going to Sunday school, but they would be going to church with their parents. And we feel from the board that we must assist the parishes to formulate programs that will take in the entire family to worship and to assist in the furtherance of the work of the Anglican Church. In the Caribbean, we're very fond of looking at our men and finding all kinds of reasons why they don't do the right thing. But we don't find out what they feel about what's happening. And in that group, they talk about their family lives. They talk about the problems they see. And they're very open to accepting assistance of any kind to help them to live better lives. Let us say, for example, you now fall in love a second time. And this is possible. We say, don't leave the church. And we provide for a remarriage of those who have been divorced. Of course, not because you've been in another church and you got divorced, you come to us. This is a facility for Anglicans. This is how the church in its pastoral ministry cares. So we say to our people, all right, your marriage is broken down and you're divorced, we will help you. You fall in love again, let us help you. So we have the doctor giving you medication, Mr. Hannes, to help you with the legal affair, and then they have food stuff. So we're trying to impress the people, they have help. So they have to have pretty clothes to come down, and that's why they can come to the nearby center, the nearby place there, where they could come and worship. And as long as they have faith, and one of the things the parents have to indoctrinate the children of today, you must not look at your friend or your, or your neighbor to see what they have. If you are to get what you to get, you will get it on time. You must be all and be contented. One of the points the young people have to learn today is contentment. Well, our reward is not here on earth, but it is also in heaven. And it's a reward if your heart and your mind is into it. You do get a reward. If your heart is not there, if your body is only there and not your mind, you're not going to get a reward. Your heart has to be in it which in my heart is in it. 1998 was a landmark year for the Cathedral Church of the Holy Trinity. It marked the 175th anniversary of the consecration of the Parish Church of the Holy Trinity and the 125th anniversary of the Diocese of Trinidad and Tobago. The occasion has been marked by special services, a commemorative brochure, but more than that, it has been for the clergy and congregation of the Anglican Church a time for stock-taking and looking ahead. Home and family life has always been a challenge, but the problems now are more intense, they are more severe. And we in the church, and I will confess this, we in the church are not doing enough. I believe that people, when they fall in love, need to have far more counselling and preparation for Christian marriage than is being done. It is also necessary for the church to give support to young married couples. We're not doing this enough. There should be a young married couples group in every congregation. There are three areas that I would like to emphasize and I have mentioned them in a meeting I held with the clergy here in Trinidad. The first is as Anglicans, we have to become more aware of who we are. We have to get to know our tradition and what we stand for. 
because there are many Anglicans who are weak in this area, who are very unclear and imprecise in terms of their hold on the faith. And so the strength of their allegiance to anything is directly related to how familiar you are with who you are and what you stand for. So that's an, an area of focus that will require a lot more teaching and a different use of resources. I think we will have to use the media more often in more creative ways, but when you know who you are, to work with that. Secondly, we need to become more aware of what's happening in the context in which we live, what's going on around us, not only in the religious sphere, but also in the secular world. For us to witness effectively, we must do it in context. We must be totally aware of what is going on around us. Now that takes looking, seeing, it takes consultation. We need to have seminars where we reflect on what's going on and then we try to see in this context, how do we best declare our mission? Within this context, how do we best offer what we have? And then the third area is what I call a, a critical look at how we project ourselves. In the commercial sphere, it will be called, how do we market our product? But we are not selling Christianity. But in a sense, the marketing concepts have to be used. This is who we are, this is what we believe now. This is the context in which we live now. How do we get this across? And how do we make it attractive without losing integrity? I would want to say to the diocese that there is a dire need to attract more persons to the ordained ministry because we do need a well-equipped ordained ministry to give the moral, spiritual and theological leadership to the people of God in the country. So I would hope that efforts will be made to work in those areas to equip the church to give a leadership role in the society. It's been a marvelous and exciting thing to be a young man called from one profession into the church because I didn't begin into the church into, as a clergyman. I was called out of one profession into this and it has been a most exciting time for me. It has had its pain and its grief but overall being a priest and then being a bishop has been an exciting thing for me. The one role model that is perfect is our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Now look at him. He never hurt anybody. The things he had to say to people were always things of upliftment. He identified with their pain. Sometimes you didn't even have to cry out to him for help. You remember that story where he enters the city of Nain and he sees a funeral procession and there was the mother of this boy who was being buried in deep grief and his heart went out to her. He, she didn't ask for help but he saw her need and met it. We can say to people to rise up from their situations, be alive to the, to the promises and the hope that is still there for you. Look around you. This is God's world and in God's world there is never a lack of hope, a lack of love, a lack of life. And if we can find those things and hold on to them and spread them abroad, we will always be people of life and hope and love. I can give no better message than the message that has been given by Jesus Christ himself who in summarizing the law said that we have to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And it is in the working out of that that we will be showing forth our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So our message as Anglicans, as Christians, is a message of love for God and love for our fellow human beings. Love God and know no other love but God. Because we say, be thou our guardian and our guide, and hear us when we call. Let not our slippery footsteps slip, but hold us if we fall.